The mills open at 8 and close at 5. Saturday afternoons and Sundays off. Humphrey Jennings directed Spare Time in 1939. It was commissioned by the government, which wanted something light-hearted to be shown at the World's Fair. It's a film about the fun ordinary British people have on their days off. Jennings assembled a series of striking images to create a touching documentary portrait of ordinary life in Britain at the end of the 1930s. In spare time, Britain has an ambiguous beauty. It's an awkward country of small pleasures. This did not go down well with the hard core of the movement. Some documentarists accuse Jennings of a patronizing, sometimes almost sneering attitude towards the efforts of low income groups. And laughing at the plebs. The movement became caught up in an argument about how to portray ordinary life. But in 1939, the future course of the documentary was out of their hands. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a fine that no such undertaking has been received, and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. The Second World War, which began in September 1939, started badly for the documentarists. Flogging phones and the postal service was no longer a priority for the British government. All the war effort required from film production was propaganda for the home front. The man in charge of commissioning propaganda films was Sir Joseph Ball. An extreme right-wing spymaster, he was deeply suspicious of the lefties in documentaries. Ball refused to meet with anyone from the movement. For the first few months of the war, the GPO film unit did absolutely nothing. Basil Wright wrote to the newspapers. When are we going to start? Harry Watt was bursting with frustration. We sat on our backsides, terribly anxious to work, and did nothing at all. We were given nothing to do. I'm going mad. A highly skilled, eager unit with lots of gear and lots of film. We'd, we'd stored up gear and film ready for the war. It was obviously coming. The GPO film unit reminded each other they could make the kind of films the country needed. The documentary movement's ultimate goal was to create a sense of unity in Britain. Up till now, this message had been hidden in promotional films for British industry or the postal service. With the country at war, it was time for their message of unity to become explicit. They decided to show the government what they could do. With no official funding or support, the GPO film unit went out into the world with loaded cameras. They would demonstrate the power of documentary. London is calling. London calling to the world. The Monday morning workers left their tube trains to face a new world where everything seemed strange. First days of 1939 is a remarkable snapshot of Britain as the country stands on the brink of apocalypse. The shining facades of the West End put up barricades. It's a vivid record of how this historic moment was playing out in the streets. It's also uplifting. 
three quarters of a million children had been moving out of the London region during the weekend. The documentarists had been trained to have an optimistic outlook. For this was a city of children. London has many monuments to the dead past, but the real London is its young life, its future. First Day celebrates Britain's stiff upper lips, their determination to keep on. It gives heart. Back in the West End, life is flowing by in the old channel. As soon as it was complete, a copy of First Days was sent direct to the Houses of Parliament. So the government could see for themselves how the documentarists would contribute to the war effort. In 1940, the film unit was moved out of the GPO and into a new government department, the Ministry of Information. The MOI had been established to control propaganda in wartime. It named its new film unit the Crown Film Unit and immediately set the documentarists to work. It is late afternoon and the people of London are preparing for the night. Everyone is anxious to get home before darkness falls, before our nightly visitors arrive. London Can Take It was made in 1940. Britain then stood alone. America was not yet in the war. The British government commissioned a documentary about how the capital was bearing up under German bombing raids. It was hoped this might sway US public opinion towards an alliance with Britain. Now they're going into the public shelters. This is not a pleasant way to spend the night, but the people accept it as their part in the defense of London. Apart from the American drawl of the voiceover, London Can Take It is a classic work of the British documentary movement. And there's the wail of the banshee. The nightly siege of London has begun. The city is dressed for battle. All classes of Britons are shown suffering together. And it feels like an authentic picture of ordinary life in the Blitz. These are not Hollywood sound effects. This is the music they play every night in London, the symphony of war. London Can Take It was also released in Britain while the Blitz was still raging. The MOI put observers in the audience who noted that the audience enjoyed it as part of their own experience. It is true that the Nazis will be When released in the US, it was a massive hit and got nominated for an Oscar. They will drop thousands of bombs and they'll destroy hundreds of buildings and they'll kill thousands of people. But a bomb has its limitations. It can only destroy buildings and kill people. It cannot kill the unconquerable spirit and courage of the people of London. At its worst, during that terrible winter of the Blitz, the Germans bombed London for 76 consecutive nights. A similar hell was visited on many other major British cities. Over 40,000 Britons were killed.